That's what she meant to say. All right, here we are in John chapter 8. And we've kind of come to this verse 20 here, tying off one section and going to another section. Jesus is really trying to reveal himself to these Jewish teachers and priests and they're shutting him down rather quickly he says i am the light of the world and they say your testimony is not true so he has to deal with that and he ends this section they ask him so where's your father and Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. And what an amazing thought to consider just for a second again. That if you want to know God, you get to know Jesus. And when you know Jesus, you know the father. Well... These poor guys, as we note here in the margins, they're missing it. And we notice that he spoke in the treasury. That's where the court of the women is. And no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. I think it was a missionary. I don't, I don't know who said it, but... He said, you're basically not going to die till your time comes. So you might as well go for it. <laughs> because you're basically indestructible until you die. Mike Vrooman said that. Say it again if you can quote it right. I think you're, I'm basically immortal until my time comes. All right. So I just... Now this, <laughs> this gentleman was planting a Calvary chapel in Alangapo, Philippines. And a lot of his people came from the garbage dump where they lived to his church. And what a guy. You're basically immortal until your time, time comes. So you might as well go for it. This does not mean play football in traffic. It means live extremely for Jesus. It'll be okay. All right. His hour had not yet come. So we're picking it up there in verse 21. Then he said to them again, I go away and you will seek me and will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews were saying, surely he will not kill himself, will he? Since he says, where I'm going, you cannot come. And he was saying to them, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So they were saying to him, who are you? Jesus said to them, what have I been saying to you from the beginning? All right. So here's Jesus, and he's attempting to reveal himself. But you know, he's also revealing them. He's talking about where they're at. He's saying, I am going away, you will seek me, which is interesting because they haven't sought him up to now. But he says, you will seek me and will die in your sin. Now, what happens when you die in your sin? No. Wow. Wow. Eternal judgment.
And you remember that if you sin against an eternal God, his wrath is eternal. So sin is not a light thing. It's not on the same level as, okay, I stuck my used chewing gum under my chair. What's my penalty? It's much, much greater than we understand. So you do not want to die in your sin. He says, where I'm going, you cannot come. Where is he going? Heaven. When he says you will seek me, is he not talking about they're still waiting for the Messiah? Could be. He says, you will seek me. They haven't taken him as the Messiah. No. Still waiting. Yeah. So there's... They're basically still seeking because they've overlooked him. Yeah. You know who they're looking for is somebody who's going to exalt the nation of Israel and defeat all of their enemies and let them live in the land. And there's promises in the prophets. They'll be the head and not the tail. Stuff like that. The wealth of the nations will come to them. Sounds good to me. So where I am going, you cannot come. People talk really lightly about going to heaven. And they assume that, as in the case of famous musicians, you know, rock stars who die, they assume, boom, they're in heaven. Like God really values the musical skill. So, you know, somebody dies and they say, yeah, they're jamming with Jimi Hendrix now. And it's funny how people assume, oh man, for sure, that guy for sure is there. But Jesus says, you cannot come. And these men know the word of God. They're the principal interpreters of the word for the last hundred years. And he's saying, where I'm going, you cannot come. And so they're trying to think now, where could he go that we cannot go? And they come up with a solution. Maybe he's going to kill himself. And I think they think if he kills himself, he's going to go to the place of the dead. They don't expect to go there. They're going to go straight to Abraham. They're thinking, oh, yeah, Abraham is right there at the mouth of hell to stop any Jew from going there. He'll say, well, not you. And he's going to pull him aside and save him right at the mouth of hell. So they're positive. I'm not going there. Abraham's looking out for me. But they're thinking, well, maybe he's going to kill himself. Maybe that's what he's thinking. Kill himself. That'll solve everything. Say, more. say it again, please. All right. Missed that. We missed that. Sorry, that was my husband making a comment before I had a chance to mute it. Sorry. <laughs> okay. That's fine. How are you tonight? I'm all right. Thank you. Good. Join we, you. Yeah. We handle the odd comment out of nowhere. <laughs> all right. Verse 23, and he was saying to them, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Now, I don't know how you could be more clear and simple in trying to tell them. If, if you are from below, what does that mean? Where is below? 
Well, I mean, he's talking to these guys. Hello from the father. So on, on, on the Look, earth. earth. And you were earth. God is earth. Down. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You are from below. That's the way he calls it. I'm from above. So where's that? Heaven. It has to be. Now look, we just figured it out. And we're, we're right here in Hampton. <laughs> this isn't even Oxford. <laughs> but we figured it out. You are of this world. Okay, I am not of this world. Just for kicks, I want to look in the original language. When he says world, it's the Greek word cosmos. And it means order. It is the entire universe. I mean, that's the way we use this word now. And Jesus is saying, I am not from this order. I am not of this. Creation? I mean, because... Okay. Supernatural. Yeah. He is above. He's transcendent. You know, when the Russians went into space, they said, well, we don't see God here. We still don't see God. There is no God. But we're talking above the universe. Go as far as you will in the universe. You're not to heaven. Heaven is above the creation. So you think of all those uh, space telescope photographs where you've got all these galaxies mm -hmm. and it goes on and on. They have not found the end of it. But Jesus says, I am above. And you know, when he says I'm above, he is even above heaven. The heavens of the heavens cannot contain God. So he is not of the cosmos. That's the Greek spelling. Just in, think, in case you think I got it wrong. <laughs> what? what school did he go to? Sesame Street. <laughs> Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Now, let's go back to... If, if, you, if you notice there in verse 24, I don't know if you can see it. You know that that word he is in italics. And in this particular translation, it's the New American Standard. There's a convention that words supplied by the translator in order to make it read more smoothly in English are set apart with italics. And it used to confuse me because I thought, you know, usually italics is a convention for emphasis. So it sounds like he's saying, unless you believe that I am, hmm. <laughs> right. but that's not what he's getting at. If you're to take that literally, he's saying, unless you believe that I am, hmm. you will die in your sins. Now that's different because what he's saying there is the name of God. When he appeared in a burning bush to Moses and the bush isn't being burned up and he says, Moses, I want you to work for me. And Moses says, I'm not sure I want the job. And one of his excuses for not wanting the job is they're going to say, who sent you? What do I say? Who are you? And he says, 
I am who I am. And that is the meaning of the name of God, which nobody knows how to pronounce anymore. We have the consonants, but we don't have the vowels. And it was so sacred that the Jews just thought, let's not take the name in vain at all. They never said it. After a while, they really don't know how to pronounce it. So in the King James Bible, it comes out Jehovah. That's a possibility. Yahweh, you will see that a lot. And it comes down to this. I am. I am. So unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Let's go back. He's really telling them who he is. Unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Now, there's Christianity right there. When you believe, it means you hold that to be true. You don't believe anything you know is false. So, and it's interesting, I, I read in, in Romans 10, Paul says, with the heart, man believes. It's in our heart what we hold to be true. And we do not believe in our heart anything that we know in our minds is not true. So Jesus says, you must hold this to be true. This is true, I am. That yes, he was born as a human being. He's got all the DNA. He is truly man. But he also says, I am God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he is above his creation. If you think for a moment what he's saying, they have God himself in their midst. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of David. The God of all the prophets. The God of Daniel. <clears throat> he is the one. Through all the ages, he's the one. And unless you believe that he is, that Jesus is God, you will die in your sins. Because if you don't believe that he's God, you believe a lie about him. You hold something else to be true that is not true, and you're convinced that it is true. And... Since God is the most important person, you believe something false about God that is not true. We're supposed to believe the truth. So, they don't get this. These teachers and priests, so they were saying to him, who are you? And you know, it's a pertinent question. The answer to that question determines your eternal destiny. So you have to get it right in this lifetime. 
And you don't want to play around with this. This is the greatest question anybody faces ever. So they're asking, right? And it seems like a fair enough question. All right, then. Who are you? And he says, what have I been saying to you from the beginning? Isn't that an interesting answer? It's not that he doesn't want to make it easy on him. Right? Now, what were you going to say? I was going to say, it's in the beginning of the Bible, of the Torah, was... The, it said that God was there and yeah. made all things. Mm. Yes. He's basically referring back to the beginning. From the beginning, I've, I've said. All and right. also from the time they got the Torah from Moses, Moses told them. Okay. Mm. But you notice here, he says, what have I been saying to you from the beginning? In other words, from the beginning of his ministry, That's true. They're, tell, they're, they're asking, who are you? And he says, I'm telling you. I am. Okay, now look. Jesus has been consistent. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. All right. No one's the Lord of the Sabbath except God. I mean, he's telling them. And they're not listening. They're not remembering. He's saying, remember. Put it all together now. <laughs> what have I been saying? You know, at a certain point, they've picked up stones to throw at him because they understood what he was saying. Because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. Now, he could come out and say, I'm God, hello. But it didn't work before because they don't want to believe it they don't want to believe it so it's not a question of information not a question of them not knowing because right they, they picked up the stones where they got it <laughs> they got it they understood they didn't like it so it's not a matter of information it's a matter of the will choice see and he already knows they don't want this so he's bringing it back and he's trying to get them to remember what has he been saying <clears throat> now we're blessed in that we have heard so much. And I, I just think about how much I've been taught and the teachers I've been able to listen to. And I think this is amazing. I, I started really following the Lord when I was 16 years old and I heard somebody teach a Bible study and I said, this guy knows God. I want to know God like this guy knows God. And it thrilled me to death. Finally, I'm going to know God for myself. And I just think, how amazing is it that you can know God? I was going somewhere with that. I can't remember now. There it is, remember. Remember. Yeah, our, our willingness to learn. I <laughs> guess. Yeah. It's, it's choice. They understood, but they yeah. chose not to believe. Now, that truly is amazing. And here's where I was going with that. I think I told you that I, I, I met a woman and her daughter. And, and the mother was a... Um, she fled Iraq 40 years ago, I learned. And she could never go back. 
So, you know, people ask me, well, do you ever want to go back? She can never go back. That's how bad it is. Mm -hmm. And I gave her my card and asked her, have you ever read this before in your life? And I gave her John 316. And she looked at me blankly and said, I've never read this in my life. And I thought, wow, she's been in this country for 40 years and she's never heard for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And what I was thinking of is the fact I have heard that. I have heard that over and over. There are many people out there that have never heard that. And here's Jesus saying, what have I been saying to you from the beginning? They got to hear it too, but they didn't want to hear it. Well, he's trying to get them to remember. I tell you, that happens to me so often. So often I give them John 3, 16, and they go, nope, never read this in my life. I gave my card to a 73-year-old guy today, and he wouldn't read it. He read somewhere in there, God, you got to read it before you throw it away, man. <laughs> Well, he says, go back and think about it and you'll realize I've already told you. That's fair enough. How many times do you have to hear it? How many invitations do you get? How many chances do you get to respond to Jesus and be saved? Because if you don't respond to him, you're going to die in your sins. How many chances do you think you need? Six? Twenty? And blow God off 19 times, and maybe the 20th time you say, yeah, okay. What the hey? My goodness gracious. You know, Hell is a long time. If you think about it, it will give you the willies. You do not want to go there. And yet people play around with this decision. I can blow this thing off and it won't matter. That's not true. So he's trying to get them to think. Hardest thing in the world. He says, I have many things to speak and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true. And the things which I heard from him, these I speak to the world. Now, you know, only God is the judge. And he says, I am the judge. But, and you know, the, the word but negates or is a contrast to what's already been said. So think about judgment. Think about all the things that Jesus says. I've got many things to speak about you and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true. The things which I heard from him these I speak to the world. Now, what are these things that he's speaking about? Any ideas? Love. Love? Salvation. The plan of salvation. Salvation. Repentance. 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 The father. Ooh. Absolutely. I mean, you have a father who's in heaven. Heaven. Son. Heaven. 
mercy. Yes, this is all mercy. It's a compassion one of what it does. Okay, you don't know what it is? Let's look it up. Compassion. Do you know what compassion is? Okay, what is compassion? You're showing to a lot of people that the woman okay all right right okay compassion means sympathy for somebody plus the ability to do something about it to relieve a person compassion all right faith faith Mm. Rebirth. 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 Unless you are born again. What? Ciao. That's not to us. <laughs> that was not to us? Okay. Now, I guess what I want to say here check out all the things that the Father wants to do. And none of them are judgment. He doesn't want to scorch anybody. The father wants, yeah, I think salvation is great. All of these things, when you add them up, is salvation. He wants to save. He doesn't want to destroy. Now, the devil wants to destroy. And you know what? Anybody can destroy. It doesn't take any character. It doesn't take any knowledge, purpose. Just destroy. But it takes God to save. It takes power. It takes understanding. And see, this is what Jesus is talking about. All these things. He's for us, God is. He's not against us, even though we're against him. We're the ones that bite the hand that feeds. So that's amazing. Just to think about how good God is. Oh, there's going to be good. People think so badly of God. He wants to take their freedom. If you're free from heaven, you'll never get there. If you're free from your sins, you'll go to heaven. So they didn't realize. They didn't get it. They're not thinking. They're thinking. All right, so what can we say here? They don't get it. Or they don't understand. Isn't that tragic? Again. So Jesus said, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am, and I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Now, the real interesting phrase here is, when you lift up the Son of Man. Any ideas as to what he means by that? Himself. He's, okay. Uh, Jews are going to lift him on the cross. Yeah. And a bunch of people here had the same idea. So we're, again, we're not from Oxford, but we got it. Now, this is kind of a euphemism, right? It's kind of a, a nicer way to talk about something that's really unpleasant.
But if you want to know what God is like, then you look at Jesus on the cross. And you will know that he is who he is. This is who God is. He loves you so much that he would die in your place to save you. Because he has a solution that nobody would think of. And that is the father raises Jesus from the dead. What an ending. Now, you know, this is, this is kind of like God leading the nation Israel into mountains on either side and the Red Sea in front of them. And the Egyptians go, what did we do? Letting them go. Let's go get them and make them our slaves. Now, what is the solution? Nobody would think of splitting the Red Sea. Oh, that's a great idea. Nobody had that coming. Nobody would have thought of it. That's how you know it's God. Tolkien would not have thought of that. This is not one of these things you're going to see in Lord of the Rings. He's good. He's not that good. Or any of these writers. They come out with a fabulous ending. God has a cliffhanger to end them all. Split the ocean. Raise him from the dead. Wow. My favorite. Show off. Say what? He showed us how to show off. Show off. <laughs> hey. Show <his> power. <laughs> if you want to display your power and make it known, don't like a firecracker and stick it under a tomato soup can. <laughs> you got to do something. And God does very godly things. Like, die a shameful, painful death, rejected by all. And this is failure. He died naked, alone, even rejected by the Father. It is the worst possible end. With, with all of his enemies mocking. When you said alone, it just made me think of the, in Genesis where it says God looked at Adam and said, it's not good for man to be alone. Mm. It's not good. Mm. And it's not a good day to die on the cross. Mm. The cross the is... Reason why the cross is a bad My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you know that if you receive Jesus, you never have to know what that means? You can read those words, you can do your best, but you do not know what it means to be utterly forsaken by God. The saying is, you will never know what it's like to be in hell. But see, this is your God. Your God will become poor, wretched, a failure for you. And this is all your redemption. This is paying the price for your freedom. His death means you can go free. Death. That's how you know you can trust him with your life. You know that no other God ever does this ever, ever, ever. People throw things in your face and say, oh yeah, well, it's just like, you know, Babylonian gods weeping for Tammuz, it's like Gilgamesh, it's like all this junk. And when you get down and look at it, no, it's not. There is nothing to equal this. None of them are sacrificial. None of them are sacrificial. 
they all want you. You sacrifice, you give up everything for the God. But there's nothing like this where the God loses everything to save you. Not only that, but sinners. Yeah. The enemy. Yeah. Scum. People who don't deserve it. Yeah. See, you have to be acceptable to the God. And here, there's nobody acceptable. So he dies to make us acceptable. There's nothing like this ever, ever, ever. Great love. Mm -hmm. and it does yes. Matter. Here's how you know that God loves you on those crummy, crummy, crummy days. And you feel like nobody loves you. And the devil is right there to say, you know, it's true. I'm so sorry. Nobody loves you. And you can look at Jesus on the cross and say, Jesus loves me, this I know. Or the Bible tells me so. Little ones, to him belong. They are weak. He is strong. And this is the father telling him to say these things. So you know, this is the father. This is not the mean old God of the Old Testament and Jesus in the New Testament saying, Father, Father, don't do it. No. This is God the father satisfying his own wrath through God the son. And here's Jesus. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Now, does anybody here always do the things that please him? Sorry. You know, all of us are disqualified. That's a big word that means we do not have it, what it takes to go to heaven. We do not fulfill the qualifications. If we were to die in our sins, that would be it. It's funny that in Colossians chapter 1, Paul says that the Father has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He qualified us. I'll do that in blue. He qualified us. Shall I look that word up? Because the rule is, if you can't define it in one second, all right. Look at look at definition number three: to fit by training, skill, or ability for a special purpose. So when you take the number of classes in university and pass your test on glaucoma, then you are qualified to teach, you are qualified to practice on sufferers of glaucoma. And if you don't pass that test, you're not the guy. You haven't got the qualities. They won't declare you competent or adequate. So God makes sinners competent to go to heaven. He takes away their sins. He gives them new life, takes away the old life. That's fabulous. You bet. And Jesus, he always does it. Not just, I wish I could do it, but I just can't. He has the will, the desire, and the power to accomplish it. So as he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. 
So having looked at this word, that means they believe that he's the Messiah. They hold it true in their hearts. In heart. With the heart you believe. This is why you meditate in the scriptures day and night. Because as you're always thinking about these thoughts of God, you're allowing him to write them on your heart with his finger and make them permanent. It's different than having it up in your head because you can know this stuff but not believe it. But when you meditate on it and think about these things, you are grasping them and making them yours. And you're not thinking about yourself, your situation. I wish God would do this. I wish God would do that. You're thinking directly about God. That's more productive. With yourself focused on him, he's going to transform your life through his word, by his spirit. And it's about your heart. So these people are coming to believe in him. This guy is the guy. He's the Messiah. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Good question. Good question. What I want to emphasize right here is continue in my word. This is, this is the meditating day and night. This is abiding in Christ by simply making that word abide in your head. Now, you got to do stuff. You got to do your job. You got to drive that car. You've got to do things that require your brain. After you do those things, you got some free time. Where does your brain go? In the crisis, where does your brain go? See, you want this stuff to be so resident within you that your mind goes there. What's the first thing you think about in the morning? You know, you can direct your thoughts to think on something if you want. You can take those thoughts and say, okay, for the next 30 days, I'm going to think about Psalm 23. So you wake up and you go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And you're just thinking about it. If you did that for 30 days, what do you think would happen to you? Anybody who's interested in, in, in finding out, let me know. And do it for 30 days and let me know at the end of it. What happens when you wake up in the morning, the first thing you think about is Psalm 23. If anybody does that, you let me know. But you know what? What happens if you don't continue in his word? Are you truly a disciple of Jesus? Now, this is nothing that your pastor can do for you. He would love to. Poor, dear, sweet guy. He would do it if he could. However, this is like asking somebody to kiss your girlfriend for you. You really want your pastor to kiss your girlfriend? Not if you want to keep your girlfriend. She might like him better. Because as we know, he is a really great guy. He is bonkers. So 
This is something you got to do for yourself and let him write with his finger on your own heart. Be his disciple truly. Abide in his word. And see, when you continue in his word, you will know the truth. And the truth will make you free. Can you see a progression here? And it begins with continuing in his word. A process. It's a process of knowing. Why don't people grow as Christians? Is growth automatic? No. Now, Physically, yes. You just feed that baby and it grows. The baby is not engaged. Keyword. Yeah, the baby maybe knows how to latch on. That's it. <laughs> but don't ask a baby to cooperate. But here, we cooperate with God. We cooperate. It's kind of like... Uh, the farmer and God. The farmer has his job. God has his job. The farmer plows and sows seed. God makes it rain, makes the sun shine. The farmer cannot make it rain, and God for sure is not going to sit on a tractor and do your plowing for you. So if you do your part, God does his part. And you know, he will make you know the truth. He will make you know. And that truth will make you free. By the way, cheating question. Who's the truth? Jesus. So look at that. If you continue in Jesus's word, you're going to know Jesus personally. Not like knowing the king of England. I know the king of England, Charles III. Are we buds? No. So he has nothing to do with me. I have nothing to do with him. But if you continue in the word of Jesus, you're going to know Jesus personally. And Jesus personally will make you free. In Psalm 136, it says, To him who remembered us in our lowest state, for his loving kindness is everlasting, and broke us away from our enemies because his loving kindness is everlasting. It's talking about rescuing with power. He remembered us in our low estate and literally broke us out of the hand of our enemies. Uh -oh. But the free from what is really, I mean. Okay, free from what? That was the question. Oh, the truth sets you free. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A final nature. Yeah. He gives us a heart of flesh. That's it. In the place of okay. The heart of stone. Well, yeah. I mean, we're talking about all this stuff up here, right? Make you free from what? Who asked that question? You did. Good question. Somebody out. answer it. Free from what? Sin. Yeah. Yeah. All right. What else? Eternal, eternal death. Ooh. Yeah. That's good. Free from our will. Free from what? Our will. Let's go seek our will when we want to take his will. Contrariness. Okay. I disagree with yeah. <laughs> enemies. Okay. We have enemies. Everybody knows this, right? Spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. So 
Satan is big. Nobody is going to get free from Satan on their own. Death. Death we got. We from, got my, from my own destructive desires. Okay, I'll give you that, but my own will. That's yeah. that's the English language. Yeah. It's not hieroglyphs. Yeah. <laughs> You want me to write you a prescription <laughs> that nobody can read? All right. This is pretty good. What else do we need to be free from? How about this world? It's a fallen world. What lies behind? That is? Forgetting what lies behind. I Ooh. press forward. The past. Wow. I am a new creation. Okay. Old things have passed away. New things have come. Because he is the truth, then we become free from the lies. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. It's a and I didn't have lies down here, so I'm going to put lies. Satan is a, is a lie. Mm. So this is pretty good. And of course, we'll we'll be sure to follow up on this mm -hmm. in two weeks. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, is because tomorrow morning I'm flying to Leipzig, Germany, to teach biblical meditation to a Bible college there for a week. And I come back on Friday and my wife has forbidden me to do the Bible study next week. Okay. I'm flying back on Friday and she says no. And that was as final a no as you will ever find. I took a picture of it and I posted it on Instagram. So, everybody gets next Friday off. Okay. <laughs> but if you want to find out about verse 33, you had better show up in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> we are Abraham's sister. No, no pressure. No pressure. All right? Everybody up for that? Everybody knows? Yep. Okay. Yep. If you know somebody who needs to know, let them know. All right. Any questions? Okay, let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you so much for sending Jesus. Your son. Very God a very God. Thank you so much. We, we glory in our salvation tonight because nobody could ever think this up. We wouldn't think this up. We weren't looking for you. You came and looked for us. And you showed us your goodness. And you humbled us. And now we get to know you. And we're so glad. We're so glad that you love us. We're so glad for new life and forgiveness and mercy and the future and the hope that will not be disappointed because it's sure and it's steadfast. We glory in you tonight. We want to pray for those around us that don't get it. And we pray that you would open their eyes and their ears and their hearts. Help them to understand all these people we come into contact with. 
Help us to love them. Help us to tell them about you. And we pray that you would save many all around us. We commit ourselves into your hand. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.